I'm excited to be beginning part five tonight on our series, uh, Introduction to Orthodoxy, our fall 2016 catechesis. Um, last week we talked about sin, the passions, and the ascetical life, ascesis. And I always kind of think, go over my notes and think about what I would, would, would have liked to have said more clearly. And um, I want to be clear, when we use the word ascetic, we don't want to think what this next slide depicts. All right, This is the kind of stuff you think about when you think about asceticism. You think about self-flagellation, right? You know, the, the monks with this idea in the Middle Ages, beating yourself. This is a Western idea, not an Orthodox idea. Or, you know, the bed of nails over here, or something like that. When we say ascetic, we don't mean this. This is not what we have in mind. For, for us Orthodox... Now, I, I will tell you, though, there, there are certainly, though, instances in Orthodoxy where we fast. Well, we'll talk about that, where we... We mortify our flesh. We always want to do it in balance because for us, the passions aren't evil. They are to be educated and redirected and balanced, right? So authentic ascesis always has to involve redirection and rebalance with regard to these passions. So censuring on the commandments of God. And um, some of the features of our ascetical life, not just for monks and nuns, but for everybody, for every lay person, every man and woman and child, would be these things, just recapping briefly. The sacraments as part of that. And the sacraments too, we're going to find out later on that we don't just take them, we prepare for them. So there's a skesis in getting ready for church because you don't just take communion, you have to, you have, to have made a recent confession. And you know, if, if I go out and I commit adultery, I can't go to communion. I can't, I have to, I have to wait a period, the priest, my, my confessor and I will talk and we'll agree to a period of time away from the communion of extra fasting, extra prayer, for instance. So there's always preparation for the sacraments. For baptism, you have the catechumenate, where you're beginning to fast, and you're praying, and you're focusing on getting ready for baptism. Um, in the Eucharist, you're preparing with trying to live a holy life, trying to, to do your pre-communion prayers, trying to pray every morning and evening at least, trying to keep the Wednesday, Friday fasts as they're appointed. Um, and every sacrament has a, an, a component of pre- pre- preparation and asceticism. Uh, prayer itself is ascetical, right? Uh, we pray, we, we sacrifice something for God. Sacrifice is a major part of Orthodox faith. You can't be a Christian without sacrifice. Of course, the main sacrifice is Christ, who gives his own life for us. But we have to meet him on the cross, which is our ascesis, our offering. And so we meet him in prayer, we meet him in the sacraments, we meet him and fasting, and almsgiving, and tithing, all these sort of aspects of our life, uh, giving of, of ourselves and our substance to God, uh, our time. It's not an act of that great Lent is almost literally one-tenth of the year. It's a tithe of the year. And of course, we don't just tithe once, then we tithe at, at Advent. But, you know, we give 40 days for Advent. We give, we give a number of days for the, for the uh, Dormition fast, for the Apostles fast. And so probably almost half the year ends up being a fast day. Mm-hmm. It's, it's pretty intense. And, and, and those of you who don't know how we fast in Orthodoxy, there are days when we do keep an almost complete fast, but most of the time when we speak of fasting, we're speaking of abstinence from certain foods. So we abstain from, generally speaking, we abstain from meat and dairy on most of the fast days. And there's other kind of smaller customs that, that would go along with that too. We'll talk about that more later. So... Um, what is, what is knowledge? How do we acquire knowledge? How do we know about anything? This is a big question. There's a word, a fancy word I learned in, in uh, grad school, and then we talked about it in seminary. What is epistemology? I'm going to read this word. Narrowly defined, epistemology is the study of knowledge and justified belief. As the study of knowledge, epistemology is concerned with the following questions. What are the necessary and sufficient conditions of knowledge? What are its sources? What is its structure? What are its limits? As the study of justified belief, epistemology aims to answer questions such as how are we to understand the concept of justification? What makes justified beliefs justified? Is justification internal or external to one's own mind? Understood more broadly, epistemology is about issues having to do with the creation and dissemination of knowledge in particular areas of inquiry. So anyway, this is, it's, it's what, how do we know anything? This is the problem of epistemology. How can I know something? And different kind of worldviews have different ways of understanding knowledge. A pre-modern worldview accepted things on faith. 
Um, empirical worldview would accept it on what I can observe. Rationalism would be similar, what I can perceive and understand and reason through. And then postmodernism would say, um, everything's relative anyway, I can't know anything. I, I can't know anything about you or myself, it's all just up for grabs, I don't know. Um, so, but what for us is the basis of knowing stuff in orthodoxy? Anyone want to take a stab at that? What's the basis for knowing anything? What's What's passed down, that's, that's, a, that's a true answer. What ultimately has been passed down to us? What's the key? Jesus Christ's Yes. You said tradition, Bethany, and we're going to get there. But the ultimate revelation is Jesus Christ breaks into the world and reveals himself. He, he lets us escape this trap of unknowing, of, of not knowing what is happening. He breaks into it. And in a sense, he doesn't, he doesn't contradict the Old Covenant, but he, he totally reanimates it. He brings it to life. He makes sense of it all. In him, the Old Covenant revelations, which are important, now find their fullness and their completion. And so Jesus Christ himself is the key. And, and we would confess that we can't know. The postmodernists are right. Unless there's a way to break in with truth, unless God reveals himself to us, everything is relative. Everything is meaningless. So, uh, but we don't believe that. We can only know things with Christ. Well, we would we would say that the, if you don't have an external kind of grounding, what what grounds us and what truth is and what and what what um, what reality is, then how do you know? I, I agree with postmodernism that you can't know unless something external comes in and breaks into it. So Christ for us is that is that point. Um, in the, in the matin service, every, every single time we serve vigil, we, we sing, God is the Lord and has revealed himself to us. Um, actually, in Greek, it is the Lord is God. He has revealed himself to us. Jesus is the Messiah. The Lord is God. He's revealed himself to us. He's come into the world. Blessed comes the name of the Lord. So, a very important truth. God reveals himself in Christ Jesus. This is the foundation of our knowledge. This is why both Old and New Covenants begin with the creation passages, right? In the beginning, God does X and Y and Z. Um, In John chapter 1, it says, No one has seen God, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He it is who has proclaimed Him, who has revealed Him. So, we, we celebrate this revelation, and all the feast days, in a sense, are different ways of looking at this revelation of Christ. Who is Christ? What is he accomplishing? What has he done? All of them. Of course, Christmas, Pascha, Epiphany, all the feasts of the Virgin Mary. We're, we're, we're exploring uh, theologically what is going on, how God has revealed himself to the world. So Christ as revealer is our very first principle. We sing every eight weeks in our church this hymn in tone six. The mystery of all eternity, unknown even to the angels, through you, O Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, through you is revealed to those on earth, God incarnate, by union without confusion. He, that is Christ, voluntarily accepted the cross for us, for which he resurrected the first created man, Adam, saving our souls from death. So our entire faith about God's revelation to man is is tied up in this revelation of Christ. This is broad and all-encompassing. So Christ reveals himself in many, part of the things I love about our faith is Christ comes to us with many different names, many different um, faces almost. Um, what are some of these faces? Father Hopko has a really nice series called The Names of God. Um, he comes to us with titles like Yeshua, right? Joshua, Christ, the Messiah, Christos, the Lord. These are words, that word is reminiscent of the Lord God. The only begotten Son, the beloved Son, the servant, the Holy One of God, the Son of God, the Son of Man, Emmanuel, King, as I kind of him as King, Judge, Pastor of the sheep, holding the sheep. Pastor means literally shepherd. The Prince, the Governor, the Master, the Teacher, the Rabbi, the Prophet, the Bridegroom, right here. Oh, I have my little pointer. Look at this. The Bridegroom. Uh, the suffering bridegroom of the church, the friend, the brother, the advocate, the new Adam, the last Adam, the heavenly man, the word, the logos, the word of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God, the sanctification of God, the righteousness, 
the bread of life, the bread of heaven, the light of the world, the way, the truth, the life, the resurrection, the author of life, the good shepherd over here. Again, this is one of the earliest good shepherd icons, by the way, from the catacombs from the first century. So it's a very old image of Christ, the good shepherd. Uh, the door, the vine, there he is, the vine, with all the apostles. He's, he's, the, he's the, the, the trunk, and they are the branches, the true vine. Uh, he is the, um, the high priest. He is dressed as the bishop, the high priest. Uh, the, uh, I keep losing my place. The, the, the true bishop, uh, St. Peter calls him in First Peter. The radiance of the glory of God, Hebrews. The icon of God, Colossians. The character, the image of the Father's person in Hebrews 1. The Son of Righteousness, the, the, the Orient from on high, the Dayspring, the Lamb of God, the Victim, the Ransom, the Passover, the Paschal Lamb, the Cornerstone, the Rock, the Temple, the Foundation, the First One of all creation, the First Burn of the Dead, the First Fruits of those who sleep, the Pioneer of our salvation, the True Heir. I'm almost done. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last, the Almighty God, the faithful, true witness, the living one, the Lord of Lord, King of Kings, the one who is, was, and is, Mr. Calm, the Ancient of Days. These are, these are ways we speak of Him, the way He reveals Himself to us through His preaching, through, through the Scriptures of the New Covenant, and we encounter this Jesus in all these ways, with all these titles, uh, and, and this is how we begin to interact with Him. So, Christ is the revelator, the key to all things. So Christ reveals a couple things to us. First of all, he reveals the express image of the Father, this image of humility and love for mankind that we see. God says, uh, Christ says in John, if you see me, you see the Father. I am the express icon. In Greek, it's ikon, the express icon of the Father. Um, So he shows who God is. He reveals what true love is. It is this emptying of oneself, this giving of oneself, even unto death. There's no greater love than for someone to lay his life down for his friend, he says in the gospel. Uh, he, Christ reveals that there is true good news, right? That there, there, there's a gospel to save us, to redeem us from the darkness and from the power of hell. He reveals what life truly is. I love this. He, he shows that... So these two words in Greek, uh, vios... And zoe, both mean what? Life. Life. Vios, or bios, refers to biology, right? The heartbeat, the motion of the arms, zombies, right? They're, they're alive, but do they have zoe? No. No, they don't, right? They're shells, they're living dead. And um, he shows us how not to be the living dead, right? The living dead, they only... They only, they only care about satisfying that craving, whatever that might be, in their case, flesh, right? I mean, it's fiction, of course. Brains. Whatever they like, right? I don't know. But, but that's not life, right? And, and, and for all the evil in those shows, they, they do depict the fact that humanity is not meant to be like that. And, the, and the, scare, the terrifying idea is when humans become like this, right? This is terrifying. So we don't want to just have a, a heartbeat and an uh, ability to walk around. We have to live, and life is revealed in Jesus Christ, what life is. And of course, life is this, too. Life is that. And he also shows us what death is. Death is, is, is the cross, but it's also resurrection to life again. So he shows us a complete circle. And, and it's this vision of death that inspires the martyrs in the Colosseum, that inspires... I shared stories last week of the martyrdom in Tbilisi, the 100,000 martyred Georgians. Um, Tonight we heard the the saints lies from Persia. Uh, On and on and on, Christ shows us uh, who God is, what love is, that there's a good news, what life truly means, what death means, and all of that is comprehended through the lens of Jesus. So, any questions right now? Now we're going to talk about theology. No! So, I'll be honest with you, I'm not, I would not call myself a theologian. In fact, by the way, in our church, do we throw around the title theologian lightly? No. no. How many theologians are, are kind of acclaimed as such in orth, all of Orthodox history? Three. Can you name, can you name it? John. John, the theologian and evangelist. Who else? Basil. Nope. No, not Gregory. Not Gregory the theologian, also known as Gregory Nazianzus, right? Of Nazianzus. Simeon the new 
and send me the new theologian. If anyone tells you I'm a theologian, I'm like, whatever. <laughs> so, of course, but the word theology, it, it, well, what does it not mean? Let, let, let me ask you the question. What does it not mean to theologize? Well, uh, oh, well, let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw a word, uh, uh, an idea up here real fast. Facts versus truth. This is an important part of theology. Um, there are such things as facts. Now, I'll give you a case in point. I'm going to tell you a story about a woman. I'll give you facts about her and then the truth about her. Facts about her. She was a criminal. She engaged in revolutionary activities that disabled a legitimate government. She abandoned her family. She refused to obey the local government. She falsified public and church records. She committed perjury. She committed a crime worthy of the death sentence. That's a fact about this woman. She looked like one of these three right here. She was a revolutionary in Russia. She helped overthrow the Tsar. The truth of her is also this. Is it St. Maria? St. Maria. St. Maria. Okay. She was a woman of great fervor and devotion. She was kind of crazy. Okay. She put God first, more than the safety of her family. She sought to do the right thing always. She willfully refused the help of the Nazis, who were the government. She overthrew the Tsar. When she was young, she was revolutionary. She overthrew the Tsar. But she, anyway, she created false documents and even baptismal certificates she gave to, the, to Jews to save them from the death camps. And she ultimately, she ultimately committed perjury and said, I am a Jew, and died in place of a Jew. So the, the facts of this woman's life are really messy. But the truth of it is, she was trying to unite herself to God. And, and this is, and the church, theology is concerned not with the facts. I mean, facts are not unimportant, mind you. We don't want to have false facts. But the real concern is the truth. Even how we view icons, uh, I'll back up here. We don't believe when Christ came out of the tomb, it looked literally like that. <laughs> this is not about facts, though he did rise from the dead, of course. Um, but... The icons themselves show a spiritual truth deeper than any photograph could have shown. So we would say, in a sense, an icon's better than a photo because it shows the depth of the truth, not just the factual external reality. So theology is concerned with the deepest of all truths. Um, let me keep going here. Um, so theology, at the end of the day, for us, ultimately, is concerned with knowing God. This is the ultimate truth. Theology must be about knowing God. Evagrius, uh, a third or fourth, third century monk, said, if you are a theologian, you will truly pray. If you pray, truly, you are a theologian. This is an old cliche in orthodoxy. St. Maximus the Confessor, writing in the 600s, says, theology without practice is the theology of demons. So, um, theology must always be an encounter with the living God. And it, it, it is a response to the prayer of Jesus that they may be one as we are one, Heavenly Father. And this union with God implies not just our head, but our heart and our entire life as well. So for the Orthodox, words theology is associated with words like gifts, grace, experience, participation, communion, purity, transfiguration, vision of God. So theology must be about these things, not just about book knowledge or reading you know, tomes of theology from different writers. There's a place for writing. There's a place for the, the academic knowledge. But we have to balance it out with experience and with our attempt to live in Christ uh, and, and experience that for real. So any questions for me? Father Thomas Hopko says, All genuine strivings after the truth are fulfilled in Christ. And, and we would say too, St. Justin Martyr, my patron saint, said that all truth in the whole world, if people are seeking good and, and they don't know in their ignorance about Christ, if they're looking for the good, they're going to find seeds of Jesus everywhere. If they're really looking. It doesn't mean that we don't tell them the gospel. Oh no. But his point is everything good is a reflection, however pale, of the good that belongs to Jesus. And so we don't have to be afraid to see good among the pagans. Or among, you know, you look at Native American religion, it's not perfect, but there's a lot of good there. You look at Chinese religion, there's a lot of good there. Only very, very few cultures seem to be really, really, really bad. <laughs> Forgive me, I shouldn't say that. But um, anyway, 
so question, how do we come, how do we interact with, with God in our, in our attempt to do theology? How do, what are our sources, so to speak? Well, some people would say, like this dude right here, this is slide 21, the apostle, I love this movie. They would, some people would say, read the Bible by yourself. Just figure it out on your own. You, you and God by yourself read the Bible. Others would say, like this guy, he'd say one and two together, get a revelation by yourself, feel the power, and you can experience all that you need and all that you need to, to, to know you will receive. Other, maybe more intellectual, would uh, well, more uh, kind of mystical, might be pray and discover his light within you, kind of a, a kind of a new age kind of spirituality. Or others would say, study and observe the universe in a Christian light. Sort of, just sort of be scientific, and, and, and that's good. None of these are bad, by the way. I, mean, I wouldn't say, we would not discount any of these things, necessarily. But these are all part of a larger answer. And for us, the key to how we know Christ, and how we, how we interact with His revelation, is not any of these by themselves, but rather it hinges on holy tradition. Not this kind of tradition. No, it's one of my favorite, my favorite musicals. Uh, this is actually a case in point of bad tradition. We'll talk about, not bad, it's not bad, I'm not saying it's bad. But um, we have to answer the question, what might holy tradition be? Anyone, anyone want to take a step? What is holy tradition? Want, want to try? I can tell you. Tell me what it is. Holy tradition is the consistent voice of the church from the beginning, um, from the time of the apostles, the consistent witness to who Christ is, and it includes the scriptures, it includes the liturgical life of the church, it includes the writings of the fathers insofar as they agree and support what's in the scriptures and what is um, consistent with itself. I mean, it's, it's internally consistent. Right. Um, and it is, it, it's the life of the church in, in the mm-hmm. 2,000 year history that we've been together. You took the winds out of my sail. What can I say? There you go. No, this is great. We would say that the very word tradition in Greek is paradosis, which means to pass down. And it, it, it can be used as a noun or a verb. You can, and Pink Paul actually, one of his epistles talks about, I have tradition to you these customs. These things I have tradition to you. I've passed them down to you. In, 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 a, in a lot of circles, the word tradition is bad because sometimes it is used as a bad thing when Jesus talks about the t- traditions of the Pharisees, right? But, it, but in the New Testament, it's used both negatively and positively. So we want, we want to be clear, there are, there's a bad kind of tradition, which is just human custom, right? It's just the stuff of man. But then there's the, then there's the, the tradition that answers the question, who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus that that we that we know and confess. Uh, for us, holy tradition is this is this is Yaroslav Pelikan's definition is the life of the spirit in the church. That's what tradition really is. It's the expression of that life of the spirit in the church. I have here the icon of Pentecost, the birthday of the church. So tell your kid, be sure to teach your kids that the church's birthday is around the year eight thirty three A.D. The spirit comes down upon the disciples. And they're empowered to carry the gospel to the end of the world. And, and what, what is deposited to them, have you heard of the phrase deposit of faith? What is given to them as deposit by the Spirit on that day never diminishes, it never increases. It's the fullness of the faith. And then they have to take that, that truth of Christ and express it freshly wherever they go, in every culture, in every context. And then new questions will be asked of that deposit of faith. And that, right, questions we ask now aren't questions we asked in the third century. Right? So there are going to be new things the church might say. But the mystical life is the same, and the deposit is the same. We're, just, we're responding to different questions now. Uh, but the holy tradition is the life of the Spirit and the church. It is alive and dynamic. It's never static. It is literally the ongoing, past, received testimony about who our Lord Jesus Christ truly is, as delivered by the apostles, confirmed by the Spirit, and lived out for the last 2,000 years, continuously, as Alana pointed out, in the church. So, um, we, yes? Uh, do you know what that icon is called? The, one on the, left side the icon on this left, this is, this is all saints of Great Britain. I tried to find one of that, that fit the square I had, this rectangle, I, the only one I could find. So, we'll pretend it's all saints. But, 
But, but I, I would share the All Saints icon because that's a sign of the church's unity, the, the church being uh, alive in all generations. And, and traditionally, the All Saints icons, you have saints not just of one generation, but of all the generations from the very beginning uh, to, to now. Um, one of my favorites is the Russian All Saints because it shows the characters from 900s all the way up to martyrs the last 10 years. It's really, really neat. Um, we want to contrast then tradition versus traditionalism. Very, very important uh, contrast to make. I'm going to read this for clarity. Um, church historian Yaroslav Pelikan writes that traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Tradition is the living faith of the dead, made alive again by the power of the Spirit in every generation. So hear that. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Tradition is the living faith of the dead, revivified in every generation by the Spirit. Father Alexander, that's Pelican over there. Oh, my, my pointer. This is Father Schmemann. Father Alexander describes tradition as a river, an analogy. The sources of the river are always pure and always the same, always flowing. But as the river meanders through different valleys and plains, logs and other flotsam sometimes finds their way into the river. Uh, things, uh, you might even find some trash that floats down the river, pollutants perhaps, but the river remains and there are things, even when there are things in the river that aren't exactly part of the source or part of the true reality of the river, we can always kind of sort through it and find the pure water. And so our task as Orthodox Christians, as Christians, is, is to realize that within our lived tradition, you're going to find sometimes some things that are like flotsam, some weird pollutants. And our task is, is not to, be, to idolize tradition so much that we can't ask the questions of our church. We need to ask questions of things. We should. That's part of our tradition, to ask questions of the tradition. Uh, yet, we do believe that there is an authentic, pure stream uh, that we, in general, participate in by God's grace and mercy, not because of ourselves, but because God is good to us. So, St. Cyprian of Carthage, right over here, my pointer, again, says this, Nor ought custom, which had crept in among some, prevent the truth from prevailing and conquering. For custom without the truth is the antiquity of error. On which account let us forsake the error and follow instead the truth. So here's a saint talking about tradition and custom, saying that there's a time, though, when custom can become just wrong, and we have to question it in light of the broader tradition. And this was actually uh, an epistle he wrote in, in the 3rd century, as the Pope began to make his first claims to, to superiority over the Church and primacy in a kind of extreme way. Um, Cyprian rebukes him, saying, this is not traditional. This is not according to the ancient customs of the Church. This is a, a false custom, not a true custom. It's the antiquity of error. Um, and so he rejects that, that overbearing papalism. Um, so that how do we discern what is holy tradition? How do we do that? To do this, we need to identify various aspects of the tradition and discuss them. Um, and so we're going to run the risk in the next four weeks of, of breaking the tradition down to its pieces and parts and looking at it kind of discreetly. The, the danger is we could lose a sense of the whole, but I'm hoping that as we do it, we'll get a better sense of how tradition works and a better understanding of what it is. So Alana alluded to what tradition might be, the sources of it. We would say uh, tradition includes the witness of Scripture, the whole Bible. And we'll talk about what that means next week. The, the, the witness of the liturgy and all the worshiping tradition of the Orthodox Church, all of our services, but especially the divine liturgy. The councils of our church, including the creeds and all the canons of the councils. Uh, the, the saints, both their teachings and the witness of their lives, how they lived, their example to us. And then finally, a sort of category of church art, which include all of the kind of things we, we see in our church and hear, the icons, the vestments, the architecture, the way our churches are arranged, the music, all of these things we'll talk about in greater detail. And one of the analogies I like for the Holy Tradition, so the Holy Tradition, you might think of as a, as a, as a diadem, a crown, which adorns our Lord, or in fact, illumines our Lord. And the, the crown jewel in the crown would be the Holy Scripture. 
And I would submit to you, there's nothing that, and I said this last week and I'll say it again, there's nothing that I ever say here that ought to conflict with Holy Scripture. Right? That is, it, is the, it is the crown. It is the, the peak. It is the crown jewel. Everything else must relate to that and fit into that. Um, liturgy. If you know the liturgy, you know half the liturgy. No. Eight, ten, eight, 90% of it is directly from the Bible. I mean, psalms and prayers and different things. Um, the conciliar definitions draw from the scriptures incredibly. The very creed of, of the church, which comes out of the, the second, first and second council, is, is 95% biblical language, strung together in various ways. Um, the, the saints, Saint Seraphim of Sara, one of our greatest saints in the, in the Russian Orthodox tradition, his piety, you know what it was? Reading the Gospels every week, all four of them. He read them every single week. He read the Psalms every week. That's what he did. That was his main spiritual activity other than working and praying, was reading the Gospels. Um, and the church art, you look around our church and you see the icons, but it's really the Bible in color, right? It's either the Bible or the saints in, in living color. So, uh, and that would be true for the vestments, the, uh, the way we arrange our church reveals the Old Testament temple fulfilled. Um, our music, so much of it is chanted psalms. So it all weaves together to reveal the portrait of Jesus Christ. He is the one who ultimately is revealed which is why I put at the very beginning here his icon, because it's a mosaic. All these pieces of the tradition are there to show us. I'm going to end with, with a parable. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Sorry. You know, to me, the most difficult part... St. Irenaeus said the test isn't, do you know the Bible? The test is, who taught you these truths? And, and how do these truths fit with the Bible? Because he said that the Bible is like it's like a, it's like a puzzle piece, a mosaic. That's what the word he used. It's a mosaic pieces of tile that are designed to reveal the King. But he said, if you have someone that doesn't receive the the teaching of the gospel authentically from someone who knew Christ, who received it from the apostles, if they just take the text by themselves, he said they have the pieces, but they don't know what it, what image it makes. And so he says the heretics take the pieces and they read the Bible. And they rearrange the, the image of the king into one of a fox. And then they have the same verses, the same truths rearranged, and it makes a false image. And we see this particularly, I don't want to pick on, but like, you know, radical Calvinism is a false gospel. That's a bad gospel. It's not the truth. You know, extreme Mormonism, you know, well, not extreme, I love Mormon, but Mormons, their gospel is a false gospel. Period. End of story. Because they take the pieces of our scripture, they add stuff to it, they make a completely new image of, of, of out of the pieces that's not the king, it's something else. And so, for us, it's important that we read the Bible with the mind of the church through the lens of tradition. And so that stone is supported by the whole crown. It's not just by itself. It's much prettier. It's, it's arranged with all with the liturgy supporting it, with the canons, with the saints, with the church art, everything. And then and also we might add just the living memory of the church. You know, when I was when I was in seminary, one of my friends was a, a, was from Russia and he would tell me stories of his father in the concentration camps. Right? That's a living connection that I had to someone who had suffered for the sake of Christ. And in our church, we keep these stories alive. To every 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 time we gather we read like a story of a martyr or a saint or something. And that's part of our whole... But again, that's the saints, right? This is number four. That, but there's this... Oftentimes there's a living connection. It's not just the text you're reading out of. It's, well, I knew so-and-so who knew so-and-so who suffered. You know? Uh, really. Or people, people at St. Andrews. You go to St. Andrews and they have people in the parish whose brothers and sisters have been killed by ISIS because they were Christians. Crucified. Literally crucified. In Syria. And they, they don't forget these people. They remember them and their names will be entered among the saints. You know? And that's because we care to remember these things. And that's Irenaeus' point. He said the true Christians remember and they maintain the memory and they preserve and that's part of what is passed down, what is traditioned to every generation. And so, yeah, we would, we would agree like the Bible is so important but what's the context for that Bible? And what's the key they're using to put the pieces together? Because John Calvin put together a false gospel. 